Welcome, everyone. Please grab a seat. And if you're not finding a seat here, please, uh, our staff at the doorway will help you to an overflow room spot where you'll be able to hear and see everything. Welcome to San Francisco State University's Center for uh, Estuary and Ocean Science, the Romberg Tiburon Center. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, to listen and talk with us about science. It is especially inspiring right now, as you may imagine, for our scientists and especially for our science students to see the great interest in science and in our work. Uh, thank you so much for coming and supporting the work that all scientists do tonight. Um, we, we are just really heartened to know that so many members of uh, our community um, are strong supporters of the work that we do. One of the important things that we do is transfer knowledge. Um, it's a critically important part of, of the scientific enterprise. Uh, we expand the frontiers of knowledge by standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. And I think many of you have probably heard that little phrase before. But we also transfer and translate science. We spend a lot of time working on that. Um, we do that to solve problems, to develop new technologies, to protect the things we value, like the environment. Um, and we helped, we hope, and help to make the world a better place. Um, science can do these things because it is iterative, it is evidence-based, and it is self-correcting. That is the value of science. Um, our public universities in particular, uh, like this one, and like the one that our speaker works at, uh, play a critical role in science and that critical transfer of knowledge. We train the next generation of scientists, our students, they're the people who are going to work for you and discover new things in the future. Um, we make discoveries. We solve problems. We volunteer our expertise and our time in public service. These are some of the hidden roles that I think a lot of us scientists and professors do that maybe the public doesn't fully uh, appreciate how much time we spend doing that. But I know I'm preaching to the crier, or you wouldn't, we wouldn't all be here together tonight. So um, we are very fortunate to be able to provide uh, this public forum for engagement on environmental science, uh, especially about the salty and wet parts of the environment um, that cover most of the planet and influence our climate. Um, I want to acknowledge just the visionary endowment made by Barbara and Richard Rosenberg uh, who, that allow us to bring you programs like this. I also want to acknowledge the wonderful support that we got from San Francisco State's leadership team uh, and tonight, we're very fortunate to have part of that team here in the audience. I want to acknowledge the presence of my dean, my boss, Keith Bowman, the College of Science and Engineering at San Francisco State. I want to acknowledge uh, the First Lady of San Francisco State, Phyllis Wong, uh, our CFO, our new CFO, Ann Sherman, uh, and I think even our, let's see, where's Michael Scott? I mean, he, maybe he went to the other room. He's our, our research, uh, head of our research office. Um, and uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, Glad you're joining us. Uh, we also have several community volunteers uh, from the Bayshore Studies Program uh, with us tonight. They are the newest members of our science knowledge transfer team. Um, they've been serving the community and leading local school kids on Bayshore science field trips uh, for decades now, uh, and we're excited to be working with them. If you think, I also want to make a plea, if you think the work that we do here is important, um, I ask you to consider making a donation. Um, we would very much welcome that. Our students would welcome that. And now, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Tessa Hill. Um, she is a scientist. She is an associate professor and a chancellor's fellow um, at UC Davis in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Her research lab is at Bodega Marine Lab, so like a lot of us, we have a dual existence, and so does she, between a marine laboratory and a main campus. Um, she got her bachelor's of science degree in marine sciences from Eckerd College in Florida, and a PhD in marine sciences from UC Santa Barbara. Um, her research interests include how climate change impacts marine ecosystems in the past, in the present, and in the future, including temperature, ocean acidification, ocean productivity, and calcification. And she'll tell you a little bit about some of these in her talk. She's also a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences uh, and was awarded a Presidential Early Career Fellow 
uh, career award, excuse me, for scientists and engineers last year by President Obama. And she is also a AAAS Lesher Public Engagement Fellow in Climate Science. So we're in for a treat. Uh, Tessa Hill, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, Now, oh, Joe, oh, there we are. Okay, thank you so much for being here. I've had an amazing day here with some really inspiring conversations, and I'm looking forward to continuing those conversations with you now. Um, I am, oh, got to turn this on too. Um, I'm here to tell you about ocean acidification and how it's impacting the California coast. And a first very important thing that I need to tell you is that I'm here representing a group of really excellent scientists at Bodega Marine Lab who work on this problem. So everything I tell you about today has been a team effort and I'm just here representing the team. Um, and that team of scientists that I work with, um, we have been working together for over a decade, uh, about a decade um, uh, on this problem that is a, a very pressing problem um, in the ocean. And you will also notice um, that I have a picture here of myself with um, two very important small field assistants. Um, this is me, um, what I look like in normal life, um, sampling um, at Van Damme State Park, one of my favorite places on the California coast. Um, and I'll actually show you data from that day today in my talk. Um, I'm here to tell you a story, essentially. So tonight is about storytelling, about the West Coast. And the story has characters. It has characters that are both people and animals. It has a problem that needs to be solved. And it has potential solutions. Um, we're working towards those solutions. And I might have to come back later and tell you more chapters of the story as we resolve this problem. Um, but I hope that what you'll enjoy today is the story of how this science has evolved in our neighborhood um, and also how we can play a part in the solutions to the story. Um, in addition to touching um, on these three, three things, I will try very hard to spend some time at the end about what we can all do about this problem. Before we can jump into that, before we can jump into ocean acidification and what it means for us, we have to set the stage of where we are in time. And so I'm actually going to back out of this talk and show you an animation. And anyone who's interested in this, I can um, show you the link for it as I back back out. I'm going to run this in just a second, but to orient you first, I'm going to show you sort of what's going to be happening on the screen. So over here along the left, um, you will see, I can't get that little thing to go away, but um, you will see um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere um, as sampled through multiple locations across the Earth's surface. And so, for example, this red location is here in Hawaii. So that red dot will always reflect the carbon dioxide that was measured um, in the air above Hawaii through time. The blue dot, similarly, is a measurement station in the Antarctic. I'm going to move it, I'm going to press play in just a minute, and the clock will move forward in time. And you'll see several different things, and I can point out some things to you, but one of the things I wanted to point out is that through time we will get more sampling stations. So you'll see more dots appear on the screen, and they're plotted by latitude. So these ones are in the southern hemisphere, and these are in the northern hemisphere, and this is the concentration of CO2 along here. And then just for your reference, over here it actually will plot just those two perhaps most important, some of the longest standing information that we have about carbon dioxide. The red and the blue dot will actually plot on their own, on their own over here on the right. And when we get to 2016, which is the most recent version of this animation, um, the screen will actually change and will start moving backwards in time. And then when that happens, I'm going to orient you to what the data look like as we move backwards in time. So this is starting in 1979. And so, like I told you, you can observe a couple of things about these data sets. Um, one is that we're adding sampling points. Um, we've been doing a better job through time studying carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. You're also seeing the seasonal signal of plants 
across the Earth's surface. When we have a lot of photosynthesis in the northern hemisphere during the northern hemisphere summer, those CO2 values actually go down. The plants in the northern hemisphere are literally taking that carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, so you're seeing that really large seasonal cycle in the northern hemisphere and a smaller one in the southern hemisphere. There's more terrestrial um, area in the northern hemisphere, so there's more of a seasonal signal there. And by now, I think you'll agree with me that we are seeing very significant changes from what we observed in 1979. Around the year 2000, we start seeing spikes above 400 parts per million in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. At this point, um, you will see, oh, I'll just point out, well, I'll pause there, and I'll point out to you that also you can see that large seasonal signal in the red time series and smaller in the blue. So again, that's Hawaii versus the Antarctic. So around 2010, we started um, crossing the threshold um, over to um, above 400 parts per million for much of the year. Um, and soon you will see the time series actually cross above 400 parts per million and stay above there. We have not gone back. I happen to know there's actually an expert in the room on the Pliocene, which is the last time that we saw CO2 concentrations this high. That was about four million years ago. So now we're gonna start moving backwards in time. So what's happened here is that this, this, um, the red data set is actually a little bit longer than what was shown originally, so it extended it. Now what you're seeing is the addition of data from ice cores. So this is a pretty amazing scientific feat. We can go to ice um, in the Antarctic or in Greenland or in mountain ranges around the world. We can take a sample of the ice. We can figure out the age of the ice and we can measure a gas bubble in the ice. And that tells us what the concentrations of the atmosphere were at that age. It is really remarkable. It's essentially a time machine looking back in Earth's history. So let me orient you here. These were ice cores that were sort of very recent records. And we're now looking at an ice core that the scientific community has developed through great effort in Antarctica. Um, this ice core actually extends back to about a million years. We're not gonna see um, all of that on the screen today, but close. And in a moment, I'm gonna pause this because if I don't, it goes to the credits and we don't get to absorb this. So now what we have is the context of um, today's atmospheric CO2 concentrations compared to what we see in ice cores going back um, for nearly a million years. What you're seeing there in the increase and the decrease is essentially the heartbeat of the Earth's climate system. Those are ice ages and deglaciations, so each time there was very low carbon dioxide concentrations. We were having an ice age across the Earth's surface. Um, when those convert up to very high CO2 concentrations, we see melting of much of the ice sheets across the Earth's surface. This has happened multiple times over the past million years due to changes in the amount of radiation we receive from the sun. And these are very predictable changes that scientists have known about and mathematically predict predicted for a very long time. So this is the context of how the Earth's climate has changed in the past in terms of carbon dioxide concentrations. And this is the context of where we find ourselves today. And I will tell you, I've been studying climate change for some time. I've spent my career doing this. I cannot show this without it feeling pretty sobering to me. This, you don't get numb to this. This is the context that we live in. This is the problem that we have to solve. So with that, we're going to move back to the ocean now. So one of the things I just showed you was this um, curve from Hawaii that documented increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide um, over um, since 1957, essentially since this record began. And it turns out we can go to Hawaii and we can measure the carbon dioxide in the ocean right next to that same site. 
And the amount of carbon dioxide in the seawater has also increased with essentially the same slope. The ocean is a tremendous sponge for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is very soluble in seawater. So as we increase what's in the atmosphere, the ocean just takes it up. About 30% of what we put in the atmosphere goes straight into the ocean. And um, what I think some of you have probably heard about and what is the topic of today is that as we add that carbon dioxide to seawater, the actual chemistry of the ocean begins to change. And so this is a measured record of pH at this same site that corresponds to an increase in carbon dioxide, um, it corresponds to a, a predictable and set decrease in the acidity, excuse me, decrease in the pH or an increase in the acidity at the same site. But before I go further on that, um, this is where we get super into wonky chemistry. So we're gonna make this easy and fun. Um, <laughs> so some of us really love chemistry, but I appreciate. Okay, so ocean acidification is often called the other CO2 problem or sort of the evil twin of climate change, right? And um, for those of you in the room who love chemistry, see, I put the chemical equations up for you. Um, but if you don't, that's okay. We're going to tell you the essentials, which is that there's a couple of different kinds of way that ways that carbon moves through the ocean. Um, and when we add a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere, we're basically adding a weak acid to the ocean. It turns out that when we add that weak acid, one of the other types of carbon, this one right here, carbonate ion, actually we end up with less of it. So sort of these different types of carbon occur in a ratio to one another. If we add a lot of the acidic one, we end up with less of that carbonate ion. And I'm going to tell you in just a few slides that carbonate ion is what animals build their shells out of. Um, so when we add carbon dioxide, we increase the acidity of the water, the carbonic acid in the water, and we decrease the pH of the water. So this is a great place where people start to say, wait a minute. I mean, how really, how quickly could this really happen? Is this even something that we can observe? Is this an easy chemical reaction that happens all that often? And so we're actually going to do a demonstration to show exactly that. So I have an amazing assistant who is a scientist in my lab at Bodega Marine Lab. This is Priya Shukla. And, um, and the best part of this is that Priya and I are not going to do the demonstration. You are. So we need three volunteers who will help us demonstrate. Wonderful. I have one. You can come up here if you're a volunteer. I have two. I need a third. Awesome. OK. Priya, let's do it. So, yes. So we're going to do dye. So Priya is pouring a pH-sensitive dye. I think that looks good. And we could dilute with a little bit of, this is water, if you want to add a little bit of water. She's um, putting a pH-sensitive dye into, the, into a cup. This is literally it, the color of the dye changes with the pH of the water. Um, and this is just in regular old tap water. There's nothing fancy about this. Um, and if any of you are teachers out, this, out there, you can actually make dye like this at home using vegetable dye, and you can do this in your classroom, so it's very cool. Tiny bit of water. Okay. if you want, but I think that's good. Okay, so we're going to have you guys spread out so that like we were spread out around the room so people can see what you're doing. And the most important part of my instructions are that you are to exhale, not inhale. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but before you do that, let's review a basic chemical concept. When we, br we breathe oxygen in, and when we breathe out, we are breathing out carbon dioxide. So what we are doing in front of you today is exactly the process that I just described to you. We are going to bubble carbon dioxide into a cup of water that is currently purple, because the cup of water is a pH of what? About 8.067, says Priya, with great precision. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to have that level of precision at the end of the experiment. But OK, so folks, hold up your cup so people can see it and see if you can bubble into it. This is the best part of my talk. <laughs> oh. 
You should walk around with your cup a little bit so they can see it in the back, yeah. It is now a crazy sort of yellowy orange cough syrup color. So if you were to ask me, really, what is the time scale that this, is, this process is happening on, you just saw it. We just saw a, a um, visual representation of pH change in tap water. I admit I made it slightly easier for myself by bringing tap water instead of seawater. Thank you so much to our volunteers. That was perfect. Um, but, okay, so the bottom line is that this process um, moves very quickly. The ocean is in equilibrium with the atmosphere, just like those cups are now in equilibrium with the human breath, okay? All right, so now we get to really dig in on the science, because we've all fallen in love with the chemistry. We live in an amazing place. Um, Along the coast of California, this is a, a, on this black and white map here, you can see this current called the California Current. It, for most of the year, most of the time, is a southward flowing current that brings cold water from the high latitudes further south. We can actually visualize that current from space. We can take pictures of it from satellites. Um, this is an image of sea surface temperature as derived from satellites along the coast of California, and we have this ribbon of cold, nutrient-rich water that moves along the coast. Part of the reason why that water is so amazing and brings nutrients, which are basically sort of like fertilizer to the whole California system, is that we have a process called upwelling along the California coast. Perhaps you've heard about this. When the wind blows in a particular direction along the California coast, it actually pushes water offshore and it pulls up cold, nutrient-rich water from below. And so we can actually see some places where the water looks particularly dark blue and cold, and those are probably places where that water is coming up from below. It turns out that that water that's coming up from below has been kind of living in the deep sea for a long time, where there's been a lot of organisms doing exactly what we just demonstrated in front of you, a lot of organisms breathing into it, um, a lot of carbon dioxide from breakdown of dead animals and breathing animals. And so because of that, it's sort of naturally acidic. And I'm going to show you an image of that. So um, this is a, a research cruise that went out along the coast and actually looked at the acidity of the seawater. And they did this in 2006. It was a, a group from NOAA. And the color bar tells you the depth of the water where that naturally acidic water, that water that was coming up from the deep sea, is up at the surface. And so in each place where there's a red blob, we are seeing some of that natural process bring sort of corrosive acidic water up from the deep sea. It's a pretty cool process. It's a pretty cool, interesting place to study. But it sort of begs the question, if this place that we live in, this special place that has upwelling, um, if it is naturally acidic for part of the year when these special winds blow, um, what will happen in the future? What happens when we put the human fingerprint on top of that process? And this is um, the, the answer that we have from models is an image like this. Again, the colors are very, very similar. So the location of that acidic water being at the surface is denoted by reds. And what you see is that the predictions is that by the year 2050, because of the human um, influence on this system, we will see those acidic waters bathing the California coast for over half of the year. So rather than being this sort of seasonal process that happens in pockets, when we put the human acidification on top of that system, we end up with a system that's kind of acidic and corrosive and stressful to animals for much of the year. Okay. I told you I would tie this back to animal, how animals make their shells. So you're going to see and hear a couple of terms in this talk. We already talked about um, pH and CO2. The, um, the last term that I'm going to add is one that we, is called saturation state. And this purely just tells us whether we would predict whether an animal will be able to make its shell or whether a shell would dissolve. And so if the saturation state is below 1, we would predict the shell will dissolve. If the saturation state is above 1, we would say, okay, that animal can probably make its shell pretty easily. And that is because 
Things like oysters, mussels, corals, snails, all those things with hard parts, they use um, two building blocks out of seawater to make their shell, calcium and carbonate ion. And remember I told you carbonate ion is the one that we end up with less of under these acidic conditions. So here's a hand handy key to help you remember. When we have high pH or not very acidic conditions, so we have high saturation state, this little symbol right here. We have plenty of building blocks in the water, plenty of things for organisms to make their shells out of. When we have low pH, we haven't changed the calcium so much. What we've done is we've made carbonate ion less available, so it's harder for organisms to make their shells. We've made it so that the building blocks in seawater are harder for those organisms to get to. Okay. So far, I've painted this picture with a lot of complexity. So we have a, a lot of variability along the coast. We have this sort of naturally amazing oceanographic system. We have a human system that's imprinting on top of that. And so how do we tackle this? So what I'd like to do in the next um, about 20 minutes is give you some insights into how we've tackled this problem. Um, the first thing that you'll hear from me is that we've made a real attempt to integrate knowledge from the field and the lab. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data that we got from the field and a little bit of results from the lab. Um, our research group has really, um, we really believe that we have to integrate both. We need to know what's happening out there in the ocean today. And we also need to be able to make some predictions about what might happen in the future. And the other thing is that we've done a lot of listening. And so our research group has gotten in a great habit of sitting down with other people, with state agencies, with federal agencies, with members of the aquaculture groups in California, um, with people who are working on restoration efforts, and we have conversations about how this problem is going to impact them. And so you will hear in my talk and in my slides today um, the, the real influence of the people around us in our community on these research questions. Okay, so um, a, f a first sort of question I wanted to ask and answer is about these big geographic patterns in acidification. So I showed you that map with the little pockets of upwelling, but a lot of us in this community started to wonder if you're an organism living right on the shore, if you're a mussel or an oyster or a sea urchin, how do you experience these patterns right up to the shore? And to answer that, we actually have to study the ocean right up against the shore in order to understand how acidification is playing out. And so we started developing a time series of 47 sites in the three western states. And we, um, for five years, we sampled them um, every six months. And we would deploy teams to essentially sample these sites somewhat instantaneously. So we would sample all 47 of them in less than a week. So we were gathering sort of a snapshot in time of how organisms along the shore were experiencing those pockets of, of corrosive water or not so much. Um, and that is, in fact, the image from the start of my talk with my kids is from um, one of the sites that I was sampling during these big blitzes of field work. What we did then is that we took elements of these data and we, wa we worked with our federal agency colleagues to actually mesh them with that earlier map that I showed you. So we took all the data from NOAA, who had been collecting those big oceanographic surveys offshore, and we basically meshed all of our coastal work with them. And so what you have now is a, a really detailed um, um, map with many, many, many sites. Our 47 sites plus um, NOAA had about 14 additional sites plus an additional NSF um, s survey that had like 10 additional sites. So we have all these sites along the coast that were essentially hit, oh, excuse me, at the same time. And um, what we see, this is I, I think pretty cool, and one of my colleagues captured this very nicely um, when she said, you know, when we look at ocean acidification along the California coast, it's not a blanket, it's a patchwork quilt. And how an organism is going to um, see these, these low pH um, waters is going to be impacted by where they are in the patchwork quilt. And so I'll just point out to you that our location on this patchwork quilt in Northern California is that we find ourselves, depending on where you are as an organism along the shore, you may find yourself in one of these red blobs that actually is not particularly low in pH right now. 
Um, but you might find yourself just a little bit up the coast at sort of the, the end of this big mass of water that is already quite acidic. So the organisms living along the shore are already experiencing that very stressful water already. So what does that mean for the future? So we have um, focused on species that can be found widely distributed along the west coast in the of the US in the lab. We have raised them under sort of time machines in the lab where we can actually dial in today's CO2 concentrations and future CO2 concentrations and maintain animals in the lab in those two different scenarios for weeks to months. And this is an image of what one of those setups look like. And so I'm just going to show you just a few snippets of the kinds of messages that we get out of this. Um, one is, this is one of the very first animals that we worked on. This is the Olympia oyster, our native oyster on the west coast of the US. Um, and I love these. One of the really nice things <laughs> about these beautiful um, organisms is that this is a juvenile oyster shell under a microscope. So juvenile is kind of like a teenager oyster. And you can actually see the larval shell that it made when it was a baby. Um, and when they're babies, they're actually floating around in the water column. And then they have a cue that tells them, OK, it's time. It's time to become a teenager. So they go down to the bottom, and they actually attach to the bottom. And they begin to grow their larval shell. And we can actually see both in this image. And what happens in the high CO2 treatments is that we see about a 14% decrease in the size of the oysters. And then um, at the larval stage, at the baby stage. And then interestingly for the juveniles, what happens is that even if we remove them from the high CO2 treatment and we put them back in nice, easy to live in water, um, they actually still see about a 30 to 40% decrease in size. So what we learned from this is that what these organisms experience in terms of stress, ocean acidification stress, if they experience it for just a week or two at the beginning of their life, it impacts um, much of their life. And we've tracked them for about four to six months in the, these experiments, and we see the same trend. So that the stress from that low pH water at the very beginning of their life had a big impact. Similarly, for the California mussel, um, we end up with mussels that are smaller and weaker. They break more easily. And I'll just point out um, for many of you who um, might have walked along the shore recently, mussels and oysters are what we call foundation species. They actually make a home for a whole bunch of other animals. And anytime you walk along a mussel bed in California, you can see that. There's a whole bunch of other things living on and within them. And so if we see um, weaker organisms, smaller organisms, more susceptible to breaking, that's going to have sort of a domino effect on this amazing Northern California ecosystem. Um, I'm actually going to skip that one and go straight to this about food webs. Um, this is um, some recent work that we did, and I've also combined some other folks' work on this slide. Um, we've actually been raising these teeny tiny organisms called foraminifera. They're essentially one sh cell with a shell around them. And they build these beautiful spines coming off of them. They're about the size of a grain of sand. They float around in the water column, and other things eat them. And in the lab, when we raise them under these future conditions, they don't make as much of a shell. They reduce how calcified their shell is. Um, and they also won't rebuild their, their shell if it's been injured. Um, similarly, some other tiny shells that float in the, in the water column, other people have shown these beautiful, um, they're called pteropods. They're basically a swimming snail. Um, again, very small, um, floating around the water column. These things are a favorite food of things like salmon. Um, these also see their shells dissolve under um, high CO2 treatments. And um, the favorite uh, prey item of our whale populations, krill, um, also um, exhibit slower growth. So you end up with smaller animals under high CO2. So what we're seeing is not just things that we might enjoy along the shore, oysters and mussels and things like that. Those are being impacted. But also sort of the base of the food web for a lot of organisms out on our shore. So what will the future hold? Well, oftentimes when I'm asked to answer this question, I say there will be winners and losers, and we're still sorting out who is who. I've just shown you some examples 
of some very clear potential losers in this. Um, however, there probably are things that will actually do well under high CO2. For example, um, I've shown you an example here of seagrasses that may actually be able to take advantage, advantage of the higher CO2 environment. Um, they are using photosynthesis, so they're actually pulling carbon dioxide out of the water. Um, a lot of our tide pools are also covered by algae that may also do just fine under these conditions. And there are certainly other invertebrates that actually will be okay as well. Um, but I would say there's a fair amount of concern about things that make shells, so things with hard parts. Okay, so we got through the first, you know, three main parts of this story, and I promised you time to talk about solutions, and so that's where we're going to move now. Um, and in terms of solutions, I want to tell you sort of three examples of the way that we have tackled um, thinking about ways forward for ocean acidification locally. And the first is um, something that I'm very proud of, and that is that we've been working very closely with the aquaculture community in California. We started a partnership with Hog Island Oyster Company almost five years ago. And um, in Tomales Bay, we have been working together to monitor conditions in Tomales Bay and understand um, that both the natural cycles that I've been telling you about, but also how ocean acidification is going to proceed there. And a major outcome of that has been that we now have a site, a study site in Tomales Bay that is funded by NOAA that all of the data are being made publicly available. Anyone can go online and see them at any time and learn about how carbon dioxide and temperature and salinity are varying in Tomales Bay. And this is part of a network of sites that NOAA is trying to build out along the coast, so there will be many other stations like this. Um, and I actually want to pause for a minute and um, give a chance to Terry Sawyer, who is the co-owner of Hog Island Oyster Company, um, to, to stand up. Well, I think we have a mic here for you, Terry. Um, and just say a few words about sort of how this partnership has worked and the importance of partnerships and how it has helped us see ways forward. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes, you can. Um, so this is uh, a story, it's, it's a, a qualified success story <coughs> because uh, the interaction of uh, academia and private sector is really what we're talking about here. That we're sitting there at meetings and we're, we're listening to all the problems and we're looking at each other and going, wait, we, we, we're there. You can, we can work together here. And as far as that goes, collaboration in this case is going to lead to hopefully uh, developing not only the data points here in, in, uh, in this example, Tomales Bay, We've got another uh, location in Humboldt Bay that we're going to be installing in June, hopefully, if everything goes right. <coughs> and within that, that's that part of that network that these data points, as, as we can get more data points like this, this is information on th that's a result of this collaboration that hopefully we can go to uh, policymakers and be able to say, Here's, here are the facts. This is what we're seeing. And we're seeing them in estuaries, which are pretty complicated uh, mm -hmm. relative to open ocean, and uh, trying to understand those interactions. And it's been a, a real learning process for, m for me. And it's also helping to drive uh, a um, kind of a wave of activism that's going on in the aquaculture industry that if this is what we're seeing, we have to be the messengers. We have to determine the language in order to uh, work together with academia. And, and go talk to some important people on a hill. So Great. Thank you, Terry. That's it. One of the amazing things about this partnership that we have built is that it is a great engine for research ideas. And in fact, Terry and I just sat last week and I think generated enough ideas to last us for like another decade on what we might want to do <laughs> together. Um, so um, one outcome of that is that at some point, Terry and I were sitting there talking and he and I, I'm not sure who started the conversation, but someone said, I wonder 
if there are things that could help along the coast. Um, maybe some of these organisms that are using photosynthesis, could we harness them to actually help us um, locally in terms of ocean acidification? And so one of the things we are deeply invested in at this point as a research group, this is funded by both California Sea Grant as well as the state, is to understand whether these amazing seagrass meadows um, in Tamales Bay as well as six other estuaries in the state of California, they are pulling carbon out of the seawater. That carbon via photosynthesis ends up in the blades and the roots of the plant itself. And the sediments below the seagrass actually end up trapping some of that carbon long term. And so we're people are starting to really look at this as what if on a very small scale, at the scale of an estuary or the scale of an aquaculture farm, could we harness our photosynthetic friends in actually capturing and removing some of this carbon dioxide? It does not solve the global problem at all, but it may buy us some time or buy us some carbon storage for the state of California. So I'm hoping I can come back and tell you the next chapter in that story when we actually have results on just how much of a role these seagrasses are playing in trapping and storing carbon. Um, another um, sort of uh, solution or success story that I want to tell you about is the amazing leadership that the West Coast states have played in this problem. And we should all be very proud um, to be part of a place that has been on the forefront of tackling this problem. And one example of that, just one example, is the outcomes of the West Coast Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Panel. This was a group of 20 scientists who served at the request of the three Western states for two years. I served on this panel. Um, and we did a lot of work to summarize the state of the science for our state policymakers and also develop a list of recommended actions and paths forward. And I'm very proud to tell you that our states, all three of the Western states, have really embraced action and activity on this issue. And any role that we can play in encouraging them to do so, I think is a great thing. So some of those paths forward are up here. Um, to utilize a regional approach. So I started off this talk showing maps of the whole West Coast. It's an oceanographic system. We can't actually think about this as just a problem for our state, but it's a problem for our whole region. We have to address climate change and acidification as an integrated process. So you might have noticed that I actually never used the word climate change. Um, I don't think, until this point. Um, but implicit in this entire discussion has been that the problem is caused by the exact same process, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, also, we encourage the states to encourage scientists to get involved in work that is directly tied to the needs of policymakers, managers, and stakeholders. And you've heard about some of that science from my perspective tonight and also to develop novel partnerships, and that partnerships may be our way forward in this. Um, that scientists and industry, scientists and policymakers, um, these partnerships that are working at the interface between the science of ocean acidification and the problem solving of ocean acidification is right where we want to be, and we want to encourage those. So I want to, before I close, I want to leave you with just a couple of, of statements that I'm hoping you will take home from this talk. The first thing is that there will be variability in response. This is not a blanket, it's a patchwork quilt, right? It's a complex environment. There will be winners and losers in terms of the organisms, but the ones that we know so far that are losers are things that we care deeply about. Um, also, monitoring our ocean, keeping eyes and ears and thermometers and instruments in the ocean is both critical to document the problem, but also to respond to the problem. So we don't want to be in a position where we're just watching this as it passes us by. We want to be able to make decisions. And to do that, we have to study the ocean. I hope you'll support me in that. 
Again, circling back to novel partnerships, we are trying very hard to build a network of people and places that will track this process along the US West Coast. And NOAA and the Integrated Ocean Observing System has really embraced that. And um, Hog Island Oyster Company and I um, and our team have, have um, established one of these nodes of about a dozen sites on the US West Coast that are tracking this problem for the public and for policymakers to see. And then finally, I'll just say, every day we make decisions that influence the trajectory of this problem. Every day we get up and we make decisions about driving to work and what we're going to eat and what we're going to buy. All of those things add up to the very first couple of slides that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. This problem is not only tractable, it is solvable, and it is solvable by us, by the decisions that we make. And I will just tell you a short anecdote that when I talk about the policy process in my undergraduate class, I asked them recently a question, who are the decision makers? Who makes decisions about the ocean in the state of California? And in my head, I was thinking they should say state agencies and legislators and staffers. And the very first student raised his hand. I said, you know, yes, Brendan, wh what do you have to say? And he said, voters. Voters are decision makers. And I said, cheers to that, because that is absolutely true. We make decisions that affect the trajectory of this problem. And so I will really, really close with a picture of my kids um, and tell you, uh, people ask me a lot if I am optimistic about this or how I maintain optimism about this, and I absolutely am. I just told you the problem is absolutely solvable. We are able to solve this problem. Um, and I'm going to add one additional piece of information to that. For a long time, climate scientists would stand in front of a group like this and say, we should solve this problem for these people, for future generations. It's our responsibility. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna change that for you today. And I'm gonna say, we should solve this problem for us. Because this problem is progressing at a rate that is impacting the ocean that we see and the food that we eat and our relationship with this coastline. So yes, absolutely solve it for these people, but I'm gonna encourage you to be selfish and join me in trying to tackle this problem also for us in our lifetimes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you for inspiring us with optimism. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, for those of you who have been here before, you know that we pause now and we invite a couple of our uh, wonderful graduate students to interview the speaker. Um, and then we will open the floor up for question and answer period from, the spe uh, from, from all of you. Okay, great. We have um, two of our um, master's students here. Um, to the right there, we have Karen Vahi. And Karen is a graduate, second year graduate student, uh, master's candidate in uh, Dr. Ellen Hines lab. And she is studying the um, impact of climate change on harbor seal habitat. And she's doing that using some long-term records collected by people like you who make observations and record them. Um, call it citizen science. Uh, and she's also working with some novel modeling techniques. So welcome, Karen. Um, we also have Metadel Abagaz, and she is a second year graduate student in Jonathan Stillman's laboratory. Um, and she is studying something called a porcelain crab or several species of porcelain mm -hmm. crab. And she's looking at how being in really crowded conditions affect their reproduction. Um, and I think that is related a little bit to the crowding we expect they may experience as the, they get kind of squeezed from climate change impacts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Metadel and um, Karen, uh, they, you, they will be your interviewers. Okay. Thank you for that fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure most of the audience did as well. Right. Um, so I wanted to start asking you about uh, the quality of work that most of us scientists are trying to accomplish. and. Uh, ask you about how funding sources that most of us depend on to address a lot of these environmentally pressing issues, mm -hmm. how you see a scientist uh, adapting to the changes that we're going to see as far as funding cuts are, um, you know, that we're facing and how you see us adapting to that uh, to perform uh, quality work and committing to uh, uh, science. Okay. 
So I think I'll provide a little bit of context and say that everything that you just saw, I should tell you who funded it, um, that was up on the screen at some point or another, but um, all of that work has been funded by NOAA, California Sea Grant, the State of California, and the National Science Foundation. Um, and so those, those federal agencies, NOAA and NSF in particular, have certainly been under threat, and there are certainly some indications that there would be decreases in the funding levels to those agencies in the future. That is not set in stone, so I think the first answer to your question is that people should be speaking up for the importance of um, supporting science in this country. It's, it's not a done deal that we would be seeing funding cuts necessarily. Um, I think the second answer to your question is that um, we will, as a scientific community, we will have to work very hard at building new partnerships, perhaps with state agencies or private foundations to maintain the pace and the quality of science that we have in this country. And so I think that people will get very creative and will probably uh, build new bridges and um, advocate for funding through other mechanisms. Um, but I'll also, I want to sort of end that question by saying that, that funding is only a piece of my concern about federal di divestment from science. And so in addition to funding these agencies, there's actually um, a lot of agencies that are concerned at this point that they won't be able to hire scientists. Um, and so we also would see science at federal agencies suffer under that um, scenario. So it's not purely about money, it's also about um, money, it's, sorry, it's not purely about money, it's <laughs> it is about jobs and progress and uh, innovation at our agencies and problem solving. And so I, for me, I try to focus a little bit less on the, the dollar amount, the bottom line, and more about the symbolism of supporting science in the United States. That was a long answer to your question, sorry. Thank you. Uh, there have been some really rapid advances uh, in research technology, particularly in instrumentation and uh, computational methods. Um, I was wondering which of these advances do you feel have been most useful for studying ocean acidification, and are there any that you are skeptical of in their current state of development? This is a great question. So the, the science of ocean acidification has really been hindered by the cost of equipment to study it. And it's a science that I would really like. Um, one of the things I've always really wanted to do is develop sort of a citizen science network to tackle this particular problem. And the problem isn't interest. The problem is that it's hard to get instrumentation um, into people's hands because of the cost and the highly technical nature of the measurements that you're making. And so I would say, um, I don't think there's a technology that I'm skeptical of, but I would say our, our progress in being able to study this problem and understand this problem has absolutely been held back by the cost of equipment and um, the ability to simplify equipment so that a lot of people can use it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you talked about uh, engaging and making new partnerships, and we've already seen that you uh, do some exciting work at Entomalis Bay with uh, the Hog I uh, Island Oyster Company. Um, what opportunities do you see to expand interactions between private enterprise and environmental research uh, and also impacts that you see um, as far as funding streams go? Uh, what kind of impacts do you see that having on, on the field? Yeah, so I think that this is an area that we can do a lot more in. And I think, um, you know, I, was, I, was, I gave a talk here earlier today to mostly students and faculty, and I really made a plug for um, trying to build new bridges and new partnerships as a way that we can do very interesting science. Um, and so, you know, I think the interesting thing about a scientific problem like this, from my perspective, is that it really exists in a, in a scientific sweet spot because ocean acidification allows me to ask really interesting scientific questions about how the ocean works and how organisms work. 
but those questions also have relevance for people trying to make decisions or um, have, uh, have a business along the coast or plan for the future of the coast. And so what an amazing gift to be able to be a, a scientist where you can work at this interface where the scientific questions are extremely rich and they also are important to other people. And I guess I would encourage other scientists to think about um, that amazing space, the space of, of working in science that feels both fundamental and societally relevant at the same time. Uh, in California last fall, uh, fisheries representatives and scientists worked together and were successful in advancing some legislation uh, for protecting eelgrass habitat and for establishing that science advisory uh, task force. Mm -hmm. How can we best continue to leverage economic interest um, to garner um, future environmental legislative support? That's great. So I think um, this is a really great question and it gets at the heart of, I think, how we're going to make progress on this issue, which is that we have to get to a place where we can talk about ocean acidification and climate change in a way that um, gets at, at how it impacts people along the coast. How is it going to impact the food on our plates and our small businesses and our coastal resilience and um, people living along the coast and recreating along the coast and fishing and when we start to think about that human elephant uh, element, <laughs> not the elephant, but the element. Um, those of you live tweeting cannot tweet the elephant. Um, <laughs> when we start to think about the human element in ocean acidification, that is where, th I mean, this sort of gets at the other question that we were just asking about. I mean, that is where we have this, this space where people start to work together and problem solve. And this mic is dying. You got it, Joe? <laughs> um, problem solve and, and, and think, I think, about solutions and about economic solutions. And so getting at your question, I think that's when people are then motivated to call the state legislature and say, we want you to do something about this problem. It's impacting us. Um, and, that's, and that's an important place to get to. I want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, relating to the talk you gave today, uh, we know that ocean acidification, we've learned that it's a global issue, and due to regional oceanographic patterns, such as upwelling, we know that the West Coast is going to be a little bit more sensitive to the impacts of it. Uh, what local actions do you think we can take to mitigate, uh, mitigate these impacts, and what do you see as the key roles of citizens and environmental scientists uh, in these efforts? Great question. So. I'm going to borrow again from a colleague of mine that I think has a really nice answer to this question. Um, and this is my colleague, John Largier, who's at Bodega Marine Lab. And he at some point said, you know, when we know that there is a flu epidemic coming, um, we do things to prepare our population for the flu epidemic. We tell people to stay home from work when they're sick or to wash their hands extra times or go get the flu vaccine. It's something that we know ahead of time that's coming. And ocean acidification is much like that. It is a train coming down the tracks. And so we should be thinking about building resilience along the coast. We should be making smart decisions about the ocean um, and removing every other possible stressor knowing that this one is coming. And so what that means is really smart management of our fisheries. Things like marine protected areas are excellent for that really careful management of pollution headed to the coast so that we don't have nutrients, um, nutrient pollution headed to the coast on top of this problem. Thinking about um, plastic pollution in the ocean and invasive species in the ocean. The way we build resilience is to pull out as many of the other stressors as possible. And while we're doing that, we tackled the fossil fuel problem because there is no other way to solve this this is the reason why this is a global problem is that it's fundamentally tied to our carbon dioxide emissions. So we can do a lot of things to buy ourselves time and build resilience, but in the meantime, we have to make progress on the bigger, harder issue at the same time. Last one then. Mm -hmm. um, you said in your talk that you are hopeful, which um, was great, I think, for a lot of us in the room to hear. Um, this is a, a particularly tough time for science and for scientists, uh, so I wanted to ask what keeps you inspired, um, what keeps you motivated, um, and maybe a fun tack on at the end, what future research project are you most excited about? Okay. 
interesting. So I could, the one that keeps me motivated and excited is very easy, and that is my students. So I have the great pleasure of um, a, a key element of my job is interacting with amazing undergraduate and graduate students every day. And they ask me really hard questions, just like you are asking me right now. And they, um, I, I mean, I don't know how to put it any other way other than as a professor, I don't think you can stand in front of a room of 18 to 20 something year olds and tell them about this and not say like, clearly we are going to fix this because we can't leave it the way it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, my students give me a lot of optimism and hopefully I do the same for them. So um, next exciting research project. That's hard because there's so many really amazing things, but okay, I'll mention one. I'm, um, uh, I'm uh, doing work with um, Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary right offshore here, and we're starting to really dig in and think about how ocean acidification and climate change is impacting um, from the surface to the deep on the bank. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really fascinating and beautiful environment to work in. Um, and I get to work again with amazing people at the National Marine Sanctuary who are really thinking about managing our ocean and making smart decisions for our ocean for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, I hope you're warmed up with questions. We're gonna open the floor up. I think I have a couple of students or, st yeah, so they're gonna uh, bring microphones over to you. Um, and I'm gonna let Tessa pick uh, from those of you who raise your hands. Okay. And we'll help you out. You had the graph that showed the correlation between CO2 in the, in the atmosphere and the pH in the water. Mm -hmm. do, do we have um, data that shows a correlation between ocean warming and ocean acidification, do they move in lockstep, or are they two different processes, or, or something in between? It's a wonderful question. So we absolutely do have that. So I should have mentioned um, earlier that the ocean acidification piece of that has been studied for a much shorter period of time than the ocean warming has. So we have very long records that we can look at to see how the ocean has warmed, <coughs> excuse me, over the past several decades, um, even 50 years and longer. Um, if you had asked me 10 years ago what the average pH was offshore California, no one could have told you because no one was measuring it. So we are just starting to build out that knowledge base. But we do, there are a few places in the world where you actually can compare both of them. And it's, it's quite complicated actually because as the ocean warms, it actually holds less gas. So this is a concept we learned in high school, believe it or not, it's called Henry's Law, the solubility of gas gases in water, and as the temperatures warm, they actually exhale a little bit of that gas. And so um, what's going to happen in the future for the ocean is that the oceans will warm, and in terms of equilibrium, it will actually be able to hold on to less of that gas. But we continue to put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So as long as we're increasing the pressure of that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, some of it will continue to go into the ocean. Another way to phrase that is that the sink for carbon dioxide in the ocean, that 30% that gets soaked up, will weaken with time. The ocean will absorb less of it with time. But probably not on the time scales I just told you I mean, about. For, for decades, we will be in sort of the same scenario that I showed you today. So that, that interaction between CO2 and temperature will influence the acidification of seawater, but not in the near term. Great question. Oh yeah, there was something up here. Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask you about the deep sea and how mm -hmm. the layering is usually part of this question, but um, have you guys got any data on that and how you see that as an optimistic process? Can I so are you asking about the trajectory for ocean acidification in the deep sea or yes. Okay, great question. Um, so basically th through enough time, meaning decades to centuries, that signal from the surface ocean will transmit into the deep. And so when we think about model predictions of acidification, the surface ocean sees all of this carbon first, but it ends up mixed into the deep sea again over decades to centuries. And so we see a, an impact, a similar impact over a longer time scale um, in the deep sea. 
it's interesting, the deep sea is a really interesting place to work because compared to the surface ocean, it sees very little variability. So you can imagine that if you're 1,000 or 2,000 meters into the deep sea, um, you don't see a lot of temperature variability at all, and you don't see a lot of CO2 or pH variability. It's pretty enriched with carbon dioxide because of that process I was telling you about earlier with all those things breathing and degrading. Um, but it doesn't change all that much over time. And so there's a fair amount of concern that for the deep sea, the big issue is not sort of the size of that signal or when it will arrive, but that it is changing at all would be a very new, um, a very new condition, evolutionarily speaking, for organisms in the deep sea who probably have not seen very much temperature or carbon dioxide variability in their evolutionary history. I, I know this is scientific-centric, uh, mm. but um, when I was wondering if there was any move by scientists to try and convince the red states that they're part of the problem, part of the solution. <laughs> because that's where the funding is coming from or disappearing from. Yes, so um, I will give you one excellent example of that, which I would encourage all of you to look into and rally around, which is the Climate Solutions Caucus. And this is a caucus that is advoca advocating for essentially economic incentives to reduce carbon emissions. Um, so it's sort of a fee slash rebate system. So um, high users or emitters of carbon dioxide would pay a fee, but then those fees would actually be returned to us as the American public. So it's a revenue neutral proposal. Because of that, it has garnered um, a fair amount of Republican support. And the caucus is required by their um, rules to bring on bipartisan support. So there are currently, I believe, someone can correct me in the audience if I'm wrong on this, but it's something um, approaching 50 members of this caucus, caucus. I think it's 48 members maybe. Um, and they are evenly split between Republicans and Democrats. There are many Democrats who want to join the caucus and they're limited by Republicans. So um, one of our jobs is to reach out to people that we know in districts and say, hey, we should talk about climate change in your district and, and call your congressman or your congresswoman about the Climate Solutions Caucus. Great. So you spoke about uh, oysters tonight, mm -hmm. and uh, at China Camp, the monitoring of the oysters there has demonstrated that during uh, lengthy rainfall events that they're seeing oyster die-offs. Did you observe that this winter at the uh, Tamales Bay site as well? That's an excellent question. So I know the scientists who were involved in that study, and I wish that I could ask them for an answer to that question right now, because I don't actually know if we've seen an Olympia oyster die-off in Tamales this winter. I'm looking at Terry, and he's saying perhaps not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, it's really, this is a really interesting problem to think about because one of the um, predictions from the climate science data is that California would spend, in the future, will spend more time in drought-like conditions or drier conditions. That doesn't mean a permanent drought, but that we'll spend fractionally more time in those kinds of conditions, but have an increased incidence of these very large atmospheric river-like storms. So essentially receiving a lot of our precipitation in a narrow window of time um, compared to time periods of the past. And so this absolutely has impacts for organisms living along the shore who again probably evolved um, under different circumstances. You mentioned in terms of you know, mitigating uh, coastal sites like for aquaculture, oyster growing, uh, that uh, a biological solution, which would be to use plants like seagrass to reduce the CO2 concentrations. Uh, has anyone thought about a chemical solution which you would add uh, just powdered limestone, calcium carbonate? It'd be fairly cheap, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so people are absolutely toying with those solutions. Um, I will sort of make two comments on them. One is that um, they're very localized in impact and very temporary. And so we would find ourselves in a situation where we were constantly trying to add alkalinity to the ocean, which is perhaps maybe sustainable on a, in a very scale of a very small bay, but probably not sustainable beyond that. 
Um, I also think that sort of the broader question about geoengineering, which that might fall under, is that we have to be really careful as we're pursuing that as options, which may be options we need to look at, that they are not energy intensive. So right now, a lot of the geoengineering solutions actually require a fossil fuel energy source to get us to the geoengineering space. Um, and so obviously, we need to have a net positive here, right? So we need geoengineering solutions that are not tied to a lot of consumption of energy. Hi, thank you. Um, it's one thing to have a lot of people in California that have a lot of scientific literacy and engagement mm -hmm. talking about this issue. Mm -hmm. My family is landlocked, and mm -hmm. they don't have the same level of understanding, yet I would like to engage them on this issue. Mm -hmm. Can you direct me to a source that would perhaps be uh, for the general public explainer of this issue or a way to engage, not necessarily in funding or politically, mm -hmm. but with people in your community? First of all, kudos to you. Um, we should all be working in that space, and it actually was the topic of my talk earlier today to a group of faculty and students here where I really encouraged people to perhaps find um, an audience or a group of people that wasn't easy to talk to and start working on those things. Um, so I will make, um, let's see here, I'm gonna make one recommendation right now, but then maybe afterwards you and I could get together and I'll give you a list of even more. Um, one of the people that I find really compelling in terms of communicating this issue is Catherine Hayhoe, um, who is a scientist in Texas. Oh, you already know of her. Um, but I think, so what she, do, what she does a really good job of is thinking about how to talk about climate change within the value system of the, of the community that she's working with. So she thinks a lot about what is important to this group of people and how can I connect to people on the basis of values and trust and feelings about a particular issue. And that's the bridge that we build, right, to any community. And she is, you know, has done it expertly in her community. And I guess I would encourage you to do the same, is to think about where is the common ground that we can start from. Hi. Um, for those of us that aren't scientists or students, let's say lay people, is there a recommendation you might have for a meaningful volunteer activity to help out with this particular issue? I mean, something beyond the pedestrian just writing to elected officials and so forth? Thanks. Um, okay, so first of all, I don't want to write off the writing to legislative officials, because that's actually really important. And I was really dying to slip that in here somewhere, so I just, I really want to sort of underscore the fact that if you care about these issues, this is a good thing to call your Congress people about. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't, but I also think, so in many of our, I'm not sure exactly where you are, maybe Marin County or somewhere in the Bay Area, but most of our um, regions around here have people who are working at a local level around climate change um, resilience, preparing our community for climate change and what it will mean, including things like sea level rise, but also um, locally reducing carbon footprints. And so I guess I would encourage you to think very local on this and get involved in a community organization that's tackling this um, here within this community. There also is, I mentioned the Climate Solutions Caucus earlier, and there is a um, a group, if you, if you you know, search for them online, you will find a group of regular citizens who are basically doing a lot of work on behalf of getting Congress people to sign up for that Congress, I mean, for that caucus. And so I think there are definitely things that we can do both at the local scale and the federal scale to encourage action on this. Well, first of all, let me uh, congratulate you on a great lecture. Um, I do these lectures for the Bay Institute in San Francisco, about 55 of them, and this was really outstanding. Thank you. Um, just want to say that I used to be Assistant Secretary for Oceans for California. Mm -hmm. 2006, we got the staffs together with Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor mm -hmm. Kulongoski in Oregon and Governor Gregoire in Washington to create mm -hmm. the West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health. First couple of things we did, we opposed offshore oil and gas development as an entire West Coast, this mm -hmm. was very powerful. Uh, the next scientific thing was looking at sea level rise and doing a kind of a unified analysis and coordinated and collaborative analysis. I was just so pleased after having been with the group that started this, that you mentioned also with this issue of ocean acidification and so forth, 
that yeah. this extension of, of what was started in 2006 really appears to be doing something. So. Yes, thank you so much for your work on that issue. And I mean, the West Coast Governor's Agreement has been extremely key in tackling this issue as a region and has really, I think the West Coast is perceived as a real leader on this and many other ocean issues um, because of work like you and other people. Um, I came out from Michigan just a few years ago and mm -hmm. your talk was making me think about whether or not there are differences between sort of our inland freshwater mm -hmm. seas mm -hmm. and the ocean mm -hmm. and if there are any notable differences or if the same sort of activity is happening. It's a wonderful question. So lakes are different in this sense. Um, they have most, not all lakes, but most lakes don't have that complex system of multiple different types of carbon that sort of rests in, in the water. They have a more simplistic chemistry system, essentially. Because of that, we actually see larger swings in the chemistry of lakes. They're actually less buffered, so they're sort of less moderated by the different types of carbon compared to, to seawater. So for organisms that have been living in lakes, they, for mo most lakes, they see a large swings in the chemistry within a lake. And so many of those organisms are actually very well adapted to those conditions. Um, but I, I will remind people that we have addressed a problem like this before with acid rain, um, which was influencing freshwater systems, particularly in the Northeast. And it was very similar in terms of the fundamental chemistry behind it. Thank you, Tessa. Will everybody please join me in thanking Tessa Hill for a wonderful presentation. Lots of great ideas, action items. I'd also like to recognize our two wonderful students who are studying science, Karen and Matt. Want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, Romberg Tiburon Center is also involved in some of the networking that Tess is working on with the ocean um, observing system. Um, we have a buoy going in soon, as soon as state lands finishes their permitting with us. Um, uh, and it's going to measure carbon dioxide in the bay and in the waters of the ocean coming in in the bay as well. Discovery Day on April 23rd. Come celebrate science on the bay with us. Lots of fun activities for families from 1 to 5. Uh, and if you uh, would like to continue s supporting our work, uh, pay attention to those envelopes. Thank you very much. We we'll hope to see you again soon.